Hello, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, right now, we're doing a study on eternal sonship examined, uh, the eternality of Jesus. Uh, it's it's going to be a lengthy study. We've had already three parts. Uh, each study has been two hours long, so we've spent two uh, three, six hours already, and uh, we're just beginning to get into this. I, I estimate it's going to be about six more um, session, so six more weeks on Sundays to get through this. Um, the basic thing that we've um, uh, proven so far uh, is that God is eternal. Uh, see, that is uh, a requirement in order to be God. That's an attribute of God. And uh, if God was not eternal, he would not be God. So once we've established that since God is eternal and Jesus Christ is God, manifest in the flesh, then therefore Jesus Christ must also be eternal. So if, if someone does not recognize the eternality of Jesus, that he is eternal God manifest in the flesh, uh, then uh, they're denying the... Uh, the uh, identity of, of Jesus, of who he is. They're denying the saving power of Jesus because scripture says there's one savior and that's God and only God can save us. Only God can forgive sins. So this is a really core essential of uh, Christianity that uh, Jesus Christ is eternal God Almighty. He is not a creature. He's, he doesn't have a beginning point where uh, God made Jesus and brought him into existence. No. So that's what we've established in the first three sessions, and we'll go a little bit further uh, looking at that, and then we're going to be moving on to look at this question of eternal sonship. And I'm, I'm going to be presenting two opposing viewpoints on eternal sonship. Uh, so when we get to that point, you're going to get both sides of this uh, subject, and then uh, you, know, you can decide for yourself which... Uh, uh, which viewpoint you think is correct. Um, personally, whatever side you, you end up on, uh, I don't find really fault in it uh, because both sides do recognize the eternality uh, of Jesus Christ, that he's not a creature. So I'll let me pick up where I left off last time. And let me see, in my notes... Oops, where are the notes? Okay. Uh, Jesus declared himself to be the eternal Jehovah God in John 8, 57 through 59. It says, Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art, art not yet 50 years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Then took they up stones to cast at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. These verses make it clear that Jesus was claiming to be God in the flesh, because the Jews, upon hearing this statement, tried to stone him to death. To the Jews, declaring oneself to be the eternal God was blasphemy worthy of death. See Leviticus 24.16. So, okay, who, who just joined me? You got, you got me and you got Brother Jeff. Yeah. Can you hear me? I'll, I'll... I don't recognize Brother Jack, man. This is like a totally different person. What happened? Sorry, can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Brother Jeff. Jeff, yeah. I can hear you both. I, uh, you said Brother Jack, I thought, and, uh, and I'm yeah. thinking, expecting Jack with the beard, the, brother, the, the Bible, uh, the teacher of the Bible. But I said, if that's Jack, he must have shaved his beard and grown some hair. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not Jack. No. Yeah, you're Jeff. Okay, Jeff. Hi, welcome. Uh, did you hear the last uh, 
five minutes where I int introduced the show? Uh, no, I didn't. No. Okay. Well, let me just say that uh, uh, I'm going to pick up where I left off, so I have to repeat it. But basically, what I've done is uh, I've read this verse that G Jesus said before Abraham was, "I am." And for that reason, the Jews wanted to stone him to death because it was blasphemy. They understood that to mean that he was claiming that he was eternal God Almighty. So, uh, in, uh, according to Levit Leviticus, uh, that was worthy of that was blasphemy, worthy of death. So they were going to stone him, but he at that time just disappeared somehow. <laughs> so let me let me get your reaction to that. First, react to that, then I'll introduce you guys. So how about a uh, 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 brother Jeff? Um, just for technical reasons, let's. When when you're not talking, go up to the top of the screen and click on your microphone, and it'll mute it. Uh, and then when you, when you're ready to talk, you unmute it. Otherwise, if we have all people, all the microphones turned on, then we get all kinds of static and feedback. Okay. Yeah, I've got that. Yeah. All right. So I'll, I'll ask you first uh, to react to that when Jesus said to the Jews, before Abraham was, I am, and they were going to stone him over it. What is your reaction to that, brother? Well, because he was declaring himself to be God, equal with the Father. And the, the punishment for blasphemy, the, the punishment was stoning, but it, it wasn't his time yet. So we, we left. Is that a good enough answer? Sorry, I've just got to get my head around the... Uh, Get into it. Sorry. Uh, that's fine, bro. That's correct. I, I think what you said is, is uh, correct. And, and uh, uh, as far as getting your head around it, the, the last three weeks we've been studying this, uh, we've over and over said this whole subject is twisting our minds up into a pretzel because we're talking about eternality and the fact that God doesn't have a beginning. And we've been pondering that and trying to understand that. And it's one of these things that is uh, what's called uh, incomprehensible. And there was an oxymoron we brought up last time. Someone said, well, let me study the scriptures more so I can comprehend the incomprehensible. And of course, if it's incomprehensible, we're not ever gonna be able to really comprehend it completely. But it's, it's interesting to try to figure this out. I'm gonna ask Brother Bill to comment now. Yeah, yeah, the statement is true. You know, when Jesus said, I am, the Jews knew exactly what he was saying. You know, he wasn't just saying, yeah, I am this, I am that. You know, in, in general conversation, you know, he said, I am, and that is God. So they knew straight away he's claiming to be God eternally, and then that's why they was going to, you know, stay him because they assumed wrongly, you know, he was blaspheming. Well, in actual fact, it was God standing in front of them, and they didn't realize it. Yeah, and I think as Brother Jeff said, uh, it was not his time. There were, there were numerous times where they wanted to throw him off a cliff or stone him uh, for his claims of deity. Uh, but uh, it, those, those, at those times were not his time, as, as uh, Brother Jeff said. The, the proper time was um, the... Uh, uh, what was the holiday, the, the Passover. Yeah, the Passover was going to be coming up. And during that Passover, they, uh, they have that Passover lamb that they sacrifice. And so that's symbolic of this Jesus being our, our Passover lamb, the one whose blood was shed so that uh, the punishment would pass over us. And uh, so the proper time for Jesus uh, was, was fulfilled when he was crucified. And at the, the earlier times when they wanted to kill him, uh, it was not the proper time. So, uh, Brother uh, Jeff, you want to comment any further on that before I go on to the next year? Oh, first, let me ask each of you to just introduce yourselves, because I started without you. We didn't have a chance for you to say hi. And just uh, tell me and, and uh, the world who, who you are and your YouTube channel and Will you do that, Brother Jeff? Yeah, um, Jeff Dunham's a living culture, so I've got the same church as, churches as Bill goes to. I went to the forum this evening, and uh, the the message was definitely for Bill. I don't know if he's told you about it, but it really was. It couldn't have been for anyone else. It just tied up with everything we were saying in the class. 
and the the man uh, the man with the mic, he, it just, uh, it just it just knocked me over. That that it, it was definitely a message for Bill about um, go over. We'll let you tell you about it, but uh, just incredible. I've got um, a not not a very well maintained YouTube channel. I mean, I love yours. That that's good. That's but mine is a bit all over the place. I mean, my, my mostly favourites and sort of videos of my grandson here and there. But I, I don't take it as seriously as my Facebook page. But I was looking for yours today after you'd commented on um, Grace Ministries. Yeah. I left you a message on there asking, asking you like if you, if you was on Facebook, but Bill tells me that you don't really like that particular form of uh, communication, Facebook. Or, or do you have a page? I'm not sure. I uh, I actually have a Facebook page, but I don't even know how to access it anymore. I, I joined it years ago, but I've never done anything on it. And uh, I, I'm just so busy with uh, YouTube and our new uh, Google Plus uh, community, Gospel of Grace community that Bill started. Uh, that's plenty of for me. Uh, I just don't want to take on Facebook, uh, and it's just I don't have any extra time for that. Uh, but um, yeah, you can you can contact me a number of other ways, and I'll tell you more about that later. But let me ask Brother Bill to say hi and introduce himself. Hello, yeah, so uh, Bill here, and I am the Panda Man Evangelist on on YouTube. Um, by my title, you can you can you can quite easily gather that that, that I like to evangelise, and uh, maybe if we get a, a time in this show towards the end, or even after the show, you know, I'd like to expound on what Jeffrey said because you know we both went to the same church this evening, and we was concerned about evangelism where we live and what direction we've got to go in because there's a lot of peculiar things happening. And like there was a, 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 a traveling minister turned up at the church. You know, obviously I didn't know he was coming, but obviously the, the, the actual pastor did. And what he was speaking was speaking directly to what I was previously talking about half an hour before going to the church. All these different issues that in regard to evangelism. And that's a good thing. That just shows that this Jesus Christ is God. And he still, you know, imparts to us through his word, you know, you know what we ought to do and should do and, and, and you know even gives us strategic plans on how to evangelize so that was a you know that was a blessing and to me obviously to people who are not christian out there you know this this endorses and shows this jesus christ you know who, who was crucified and did rise is actually god and he's well and truly alive today amen well I guess if uh, if you've been a Christian long enough and you've attended church and heard sermons and uh, we've all had this kind of experience where it seemed like the, the subject that day was the exact subject that we needed to hear that day. And uh, this is just another example of that. I'd like to hear more about that later, but uh, um, Brother Bill, let me just ask you while we're discussing this. Did you ever take the time to watch the series I did titled Evangelism and Witnessing How To? I haven't seen that. No, I saw some of your evangelism videos that you directed me to, but I've not seen those ones. Well, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the videos you've seen of me doing the street preaching, uh, that's, that's one thing. But the instructional videos on how to evangelize, I did that with Brother Frank, who was doing the street preaching with me back then. And uh, I, I think it's right up your alley as far as what you're talking about uh, in terms of uh, the what you heard today. I'd like to get your feedback on that after you take time to watch that. It's, I think it's about a five or six part series. No, I, those videos in those days, um, we didn't have the capacity to make, you know, 30 minute or hour or two hour videos. There was like a 10 minute limit. So I think each video is about maybe eight minutes long or nine minutes and there's probably about five or six of them. Yeah, yeah, I'll sure make sure I'll have a look at them. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So please, uh, uh, all the viewers, uh, I hope you will subscribe to um, both of these uh, YouTubers. Uh, I know that uh, you'll you'll benefit by knowing them and, uh, and benefit by you know, participating in their channels. Also, I hope you will uh, join the, the Gospel of Grace community on Google Plus. 
we, I noticed today, Brother Billy, there's 104 members now. It, it seems to be growing daily now. But I think we need to continually put that message out. Join the community, provided provided that you're somebody that does agree with the core doctrines of Christianity, and that is that Jesus is eternal God Almighty, and that uh, salvation's by faith alone, in Christ known, alone, there is no religious work required to gain salvation. And that uh, once we've received salvation through our faith in Jesus, then we, we could never lose our salvation for any reason. So if you do agree with these core doctrines of Christianity, then uh, we, we hope you will join this Gospel of Grace community on Google+. Plus. And uh, it's just a great community of people who are like-minded, who share these uh, core beliefs, and uh, we'll have great fellowship and, and learn uh, from each other. All right, brothers, I'm going to go on to the next point of this study now. Uh, John declared him, that's Jesus, John declared him to be the eternal Jehovah God. John 1, 1 through 3, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. This is a statement of fact, not a subject set forth for argument. The Holy Spirit placed our Lord Jesus with God before time, called him God, and the creator of all things in the beginning. Now, we've, we've talked about uh, this section of verses before and previously, but let's just hit on this ag again because this is the Holy Spirit uh, speaking through the Apostle John in the Gospel according to John. Uh, right off the bat, he identifies who Jesus is. So uh, let me ask uh, Brother Jeff to first respond to that. Uh, Brother Bill, how about you? Could you respond to it? Yeah, yeah, I agree. It's a, it's a statement of fact. You know, it's not uh, something that, 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 that the Apostle John has asked us to think about and dwell upon or make a decision over. You know, he's stating the facts that, that, that God, you know, Jesus Christ, who is the Word, was God and he was in creation, you know, creating. Uh, you know, it's, it's indisputable, you know, so yeah, I'll clearly say this is a statement of fact and, and a fundamental fact of that. Okay. Uh, I, when, you, when you began talking, uh, you, it, I heard a stop. I mean, I, I heard silence, so I thought that you were just saying talking for five seconds and quit so i started talking so i don't know if there's a technical problem but for like 15 seconds i didn't hear you and then i heard you pick up again but so uh apologize uh for uh speaking on top of you, i guess but uh, i don't know we seem to have still a lot of glitches in this uh, technology Uh, the, the screen's frozen on mine. Oh, you, are, you, are you there, Luke? Have you come come in as SNC preacher now? Well, I didn't. I did not do anything to cause that. I, it's amazing. Did you hear me talking about how you know? It's unfortunate we still have some glitches to deal with, and then that happened. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that was amazing. Uh, all right, I don't know what to do. I don't want to mess with it because I'm afraid of like uh, shutting it down accidentally. So I'm going to leave both of these up. Um, but let me ask. Uh, let me let me see if I can mute this, Mike. Okay, I guess when I mute it, I only have the ability to mute. Uh, oh, I can mute that one. All right, I was just experimenting, trying to figure out how to use it since I have two up. Okay, one's done. Okay, I guess you you must have kicked me out, huh? <laughs> no, but your, your volume is very quiet. You might want to go in your control room and turn your volume up. Okay, let me do that. Volume one. Control room. 
volume for me. Okay. All right, I turned it up. Um, is that any better? No, still can't hard. I can scarcely hear you. But mine's fine. Let me try it all the way to the max. Okay, I've got to I've got to set all the way to the max now. Can you hear that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, all right then. Uh, okay. It's probably too loud now, though. What's that? <laughs> it's probably too loud now. I think it's sorted itself out again. So if you go back to normal, then we'll just see what happens. Let me turn it back to the middle and still all the way. Yeah, that's fine now. Yeah. All right, that's good. It was the one. It's the same. Oh, What's right. that? Yeah, if you see clouds of vapor, it's because of this. I'm vaping. Do you know about vaping? What it is? Yeah, I saw that. Either I was getting ready to call the fire department, I thought your, your house was yeah. on fire. <laughs> the people with. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now let's get back to this. Uh, let's get back to this John one one. So, uh, brother Jeff, mute your mic, okay, until until you talk. Uh, okay. John one is one of the greatest chapters in the Bible. I, matter of fact, I uh, I was talking to uh, brother Craig Speck uh, called me up yesterday on the phone, and and we got into a nice conversation. One of the things that uh, I said is that uh, if if someone said, Brother Luke, you've got to make a decision. The Bible's going to all be destroyed. There will be no Bibles, but you can pick one book in the Bible and save it, and, and it will still exist. Which book would you pick? And uh, I, I said, of course, it would be the Gospel account of John. And, and that's what I would pick if I had to choose one out of everything. Uh, and... Uh, so this, this book of John is, is so important to tell us who Jesus is, what he did, and how we get saved. Uh, it's all there, uh, more so than any other, any other book, I think. Uh, but in the beginning, it starts off by identifying this, this uh, using this term, the word. What stands out to me is that in the first three verses, something is glaringly missing. Uh, and we see it in, in uh, we understand it in uh, verse 14 when we get down to there. But does it, does it seem, is it interesting to you that there's something missing in the first three verses? Uh, and do you, can you, do you see what I'm thinking of? Uh, I, was, I was thinking about that today. Okay, is it right for me to talk? Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, the, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. It, it's kind of um, swirling them things around in my head. It's, uh, it's talking about the eternality of the, the God's eternal. I know, I know that um, it's the Greek word logos. Am I right there? It, the, it's the expression of God. Yeah. Now, I'm... Um, uh, I know that some people don't recognize so, so like Jehovah's Witnesses, they, they say that he was the brother of the uh, Archangel Michael, and, so, and the Mormons say that he was Satan's brother. But I, I don't think we will ever accept that on an intellectual level. Yeah, the flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. It, it, it's some, something that. Um, Bible scholars, I, I don't see myself as a real scholar. I mean, I'll dip into the word, yeah? And I would agree. I mean, I've never really thought about the question, if there's, if there's only one book that you'd want to keep. But I would say that if there was two that I could keep, it would be John and Galatians, yeah? But me, me being, I mean, I've been into Mormonism and I've dabbled in all these other different city cults. And I did 40 years as a Buddhist and I've, I've had a real spiritual search. And... I've even like I've just come out of dispensationalism, and, and brother Luke, I've got to thank you for that. You had an excellent video talking talking about a dispensationalist. And yours was the first one that when I started to notice the flaws in the doctrine of theirs, and, and then I started learning about a Schofield and Derby and the rest, and what you were saying about it, it it would say, But I think that that if if these things weren't spiritually, I don't want to go off subject, but 
if these things weren't spiritually discerned, then you can talk to a Mormon to the blue in the face, but you're never going to show them that Jesus was God. Okay, with the conviction that I've got, because when I first got saved, I didn't know anything. I didn't know any scripture. I didn't go to church. I didn't know any Christians at all. And I mean, the devil just came and snatched the word away from me. But what's happened to me over the years, I mean, that, that was coming up to, um, I think it's the 48 years ago when I first get, got saved, my heart has become connected to my head, yeah? So uh, I don't want to go off track, but I'll let someone else talk here. I, I think I'm to, going, over, going over the side. Uh, br brother, thank you for the comment. I thought that was very interesting, and, and I'm, I'm glad that you told me about uh, th that I was able to help you with this understanding dispensationalism better. Um, Thank you. And, and, and Brother Bill, let me ask you to respond to the, my question of we verses one through three are not really 100 percent clear until you get to verse 14. And then when you get to four, 14, then it then it puts the pieces together. So we identify this uh, this word. But it, it, does it, is it ever stuck, uh, been a question in your mind is so? Uh, do you see something missing from verses one through three that, that I'm that I'm alluding to now? Unless you're trying to say that it might have been helpful to actually mention Jesus' name in there, is that what you're alluding to? That's exactly what I'm saying. And in other words, it could say in the beginning was Jesus, and Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God. But instead of using the name Jesus, it's using the, the, the term the word and then the, oh, we have to go down to verse 14 to realize that the word became flesh and lived among us and it's talking about Jesus and then we realize aha this this that we could interchange the, the name of Jesus and put it up there because it's talking about Jesus being being uh, in the beginning and with God and what and being God go, brother uh, Bill yeah yeah, there's obviously a reason for it, and I'm hoping you're gonna you're gonna impart that to us. But <laughs> I've often thought the same. I thought, well, wouldn't it be easy, Lord, if you just put your name in there? It would have been easier. But then, then I start going too deep. I'm, I'm a bit. I think too much. Then I think maybe it's because in Revelation it says when you're coming back, you've got a new name that no man knows yet. Maybe you didn't want to put that name in there because you've got a new name. I don't know. I I think too much. But you know, what are your thoughts? Yeah. Well, I think that uh, that's really the subject of this whole study, and, and uh, that's something that we're probably going to, it's going to take another hour or two or three or four hours of study before we actually reach that point and really get into the, the meat of that question. But I, I, I think this is a good point to, to introduce it, and, and that is, uh, the question is, why is he referred to in the beginning as the Word, and then later on we identify him as this being Jesus? Uh, so let's, let's move on then. Uh, um, okay, the word, um, the word of God declares His eternality throughout. Let's go to Psalms ninety one and two. Uh, Lord, Thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever Thou hadst formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting. Uh, thou art God. Now here again, uh, it's saying that God is everlasting, uh, eternal. Uh, and I'm, let's look at Psalms, uh, the next part of Psalms. The Lord reigneth, he is clothed with majesty. The Lord is clothed with strength, wherewith he hath girded himself. The world also is established, that it cannot be moved. Thy throne is established of old. Thou art from everlasting. So uh, Jesus Christ, as Jehovah God, has always existed. John 1.1 1, 1 corresponds with Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. Um, Jesus Christ was the potentate of the universe, designer, creator, master, ruler, sustainer. All right, let me get your reaction to that before we go, go on. Well, to me, I'll just say because we know 
through other Psalms as well, you know, David often alludes to Christ without actually mentioning his name. You know, you know, because there's there's there where where in one of the Psalms he talks about, you know, they that they cast lots before him, you know, that his soul will not be left in hell. So you have oftentimes David refers to this saviour, but doesn't mention his name, you know, because he didn't know his name then. And but when you read them Psalms and you read what happened to Christ and you read what we just read then, and then read, you know, John one, one to three, you know comparing scripture with scripture you can see you know it's blatantly obvious you know this is christ you're talking about you know i'm trying to think that there's a word in the bible that says that i'll have to think of that let me come back in a minute to a certain scripture i want i want to give which would help us grasp what i'm trying to say a bit better so bear with me on that one and just carry on okay uh Brother Jeff, what we've done in the first three episodes, before today we've already had three studies, total of six hours, and, and, and even now we're still at this point where we're, we're showing throughout the scriptures how God is eternal. God is what some people in philosophy will call the uncaused cause. In other words, everything that has a beginning has a cause, but there must be something that's uncaused that started with all, otherwise it has a, an infinite regression and that's impossible. So people would have to describe God as being eternal and the uncaused cause. Uh, therefore, uh, if, that's, if that is part of the description of God, if that's his identity, that's his uh, uh, attribute, and, and then we know that Jesus is, claims to be God and the scriptures claim that he's God and then we we have to identify that God is eternal Jesus is eternal Jesus is God and um, that's what we're doing we're building that case uh, solidly and then we're going to be moving on after we very soon after we get past this portion we're going to be going on to ask okay let's look at Jesus the son of God how did he exist before the incarnation and we're going we're going to look at two different viewpoints on that and try to figure out which one we think is correct. But, uh, okay, Brother Jeff, do you have any reaction to this? Uh, I don't think I was going to match the real level of study that you two have, but uh, it makes me think of um, the, the verse, like, anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We don't, people don't actually have to know the name of Jesus to be saved. Uh, I've often wondered, does that mean anyone that believes in God, do they need any theology? Yeah, to a person on their deathbed, yeah? Who, who suddenly prays, but, but, but the, the name, um, that, that's just for, for, for us humans, isn't it? That we're, we're our theology, etc. I was listening to R.C. Sproul, and I know he's got his points. I know he's a Calvinist, etc. But I only found out today from Bill. But he, he was he was talking about on this audio book that I was listening to uh, about the terminology that that we use, the the theology and 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 the words and the language is is like for our benefit. But when, as you said originally, we're never going to get there. I, 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 made some kind of a contribution there Thanks. going over <laughs> uh yeah i i would say that um when you refer referenced uh dispensationalism in the uh, earlier comment that this this uh question here gets back to that subject and my conclusion is that uh the name of jesus was not revealed until the virgin birth uh he's called emmanuel He's, he's called, uh, uh, um, oh, I forgot. There, there's a lot of different names for, for God. And the son, even the son of God is, we can, we can see that he's in the scriptures, but he doesn't have, hasn't been given this name, Jesus, which literally translates God saves. Uh, but so before his name and before he appeared and before he died for our sins, and we, we say, that's the guy. 
That's the one they've been talking about all for hundreds of years in the scriptures. That's the one. It's Jesus. He's died for our sins. He raised himself from the dead. He's God and Savior. Now we know who he is. So now we are expected to know his name and to believe in that name. The scriptures even say we're saved when we believe in his name. And there is no other name under heaven whereby we must be saved. So before the name of Jesus was revealed, people couldn't be expected to believe in Jesus because the name wasn't even, I mean, Jesus actually means Joshua, by the way. So, so um, Moses, right-hand man, Joshua, he had the same name. So it was, it was a common name, but nobody understood that there would be this savior that we actually have the name Jesus. Now we know that. And that's how we get saved by saying Jesus is, is the savior. Uh, Brother Bill. Yeah, yeah. I just suddenly it came came to me, and I found it, and I put it on the side chat. What I was thinking of in Proverbs twenty five two, it says, "It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter." So, I believe there is a slight element of that as well. You know that you seek and you shall find. You know that 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 God will honor people who, who are generally seeking after this God and this Savior, they would come across verses like that, that, that initially are concealed because they're unbelievers, but by reading all of the first, you know, the first chapter of John, as you, you know, you're reading it, what was concealed is being revealed. Like you made the point, at the beginning, the first three verses, you think, oh, who's he talking about? Then when you come on to the middle, it suddenly it reveals who this is. Oh, this is this Jesus. This is this one that you know became the Lamb of God. Especially you know, so, and I think there is an element of that that God actually wants us to to actually seek Him. Yeah, that's a yeah, that's a beautiful thought, and I, I do agree that if a person really seeks that uh, God will reveal Himself to them, uh, but. Uh, these two verses you chose, Proverbs and Romans, both talk about, uh, you know, things we don't know and seeking and, and wisdom. And I, and you, you took a verse out of Proverbs. What are you trying to do? Jump ahead to Wednesday since Wednesday is going to be the studying of Proverbs now? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, I forgot about that. All right, we'll, we'll pretend we never heard that one because we're, come, <laughs> we're going to do that at some point. Oh, man, you jumped all the way to Proverbs 25 two. Okay. All right, let's move on to the next uh, next uh, part of this. Uh, let me see, where was I? Okay, uh, who became? That's Micah. Let's look at Micah five two. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrata. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right. Bethlehem Ephrata. Though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Uh, this reference can only be applied to the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ, thus declaring that Christ is Jehovah God and he is eternal. Uh, I remember... For many many years in my on my street preaching i i always referred to jesus as jehovah god almighty now i know that the word jehovah is not truly in the bible it's a it's a mixture of yahweh and something i don't remember exactly how that that name was arrived at and it does have a negative connotation because jehovah's witnesses have kind of stolen the word and and, and monopolized it but when we think of, of Jehovah God, we think of that's that's God Almighty. So I want I say Jesus is Jehovah God Almighty, eternal, and uh, that's the point that this uh, this writer here that I just quoted um, uh, concludes to. That that verse says He is this Jehovah God Almighty. Brother Bill, maybe you may know about how the word Jehovah came about, but let me ask Brother uh, Jeff first to respond to this. Yeah, I learned a long time ago, reading uh, Genesis and the Garden of Eden story, that where we see uh, the Lord God, then that is uh, Jehovah Elohim, the, the, 
the um, the manifested member of the Godhead. Yeah. So that's uh, uh, some somewhere it, it's it's a, a German pronunciation of Yahweh. Have you ever heard that one? Over to you. That's yeah. Let, let me ask Brother Bill to answer that question. Yeah, I I I, I remember reading it a while ago, but it's completely out of my mind. But yeah, it is a corruption of Yahweh, you know, a pronunciation uh, from the Hebrew to the Greek, and they, they, they add the vowels back in and stuff like that. But it's incorrect, but we still know who he's talk we're talking about. You know, we, we know it is, you know, Jehovah, you know, without obviously the vowels, you know. But yeah, I can't remember where, that there are some websites that do go into quite quite you know quite a lot of detail how that that name Jehovah was derived and how it came about. Yeah, but I can't. It's a loom to me at the moment. Yeah, well, I, I think you probably uh, did a pretty good explanation of it. I remember that you know in in uh, uh, Judaism in, in their language they don't use vowels and they. Uh, and you're not allowed to even spell the full name of God. It's considered uh, you know, blasphemy to, if you even do it. I remember I had a street preaching sign years ago, and someone was criticizing me because I had G-O-D as part of it. And this Jewish guy was saying, you can't do that. You need to put like a hyphen, G hyphen D. You can't, you can't spell it completely. <laughs> you know, So that's how the, the Jews looked at it. And somehow uh, well, they took white, uh, w H W I think, or Y H W Y. I don't know how it's spelled exactly, but and and somehow they tried to insert vowels and make it into a word and came up with Jehovah. Um, but we know that this is uh, eternal God Almighty. And that's probably the best way I would use it if I'm going to use just American English language. You know, jo uh, eternal God Almighty, and I say that this Jesus is eternal God Almighty. Okay, Brother Jeff, before we, uh, I want, uh, I actually want Brother Bill to, course, to respond to that verse, though, about uh, in Bethlehem. Do you have it yeah. in front of you, Bill? Yeah, yeah, well, I've got it in front of me. Uh, yeah, two things are interesting. Obviously, you know, this is speaking of Christ, who was, you know, born in Bethlehem, Ephrata. So he was the only one that was there, and he was king, and obviously the, 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 the Herod knew of this and everything else. But what is interesting is that, the majority of the Jews missed that point because when Jesus was was preaching to them, they they knew him from Nazareth, so he was a Nazarene, and they even said, "How can anything good come out of Nazareth?" So they missed the point. You know, they 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 were speaking to Christ as Suman, not shows you how little detail they really went into to get to know him. You know, they didn't ask him where he was born. They just assumed, "Oh, this is the son of Joseph." You know, he lives in Nazareth. Nothing good comes out of here. So. That shows you their own flippancy and ignorance, and that is why I, I believe is a part of the reason they missed the point. They didn't speak to them enough, they didn't ask them enough, and they weren't interested. Mm. Amen, amen, brother. Very well said. Uh, uh, brother Jeff, uh, do you have anything to comment about that, that verse? Uh, brother Bill, could you paste it into the uh, the section there, so the, the comment section there, so Brother Jeff can yeah. actually see it? Yeah, yeah we'll do it, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested in this new Hebrew roots movement. You know, they're using the name Yeshua instead of Jesus. Did, would that would that be a corruption? Is that do you think that's the devil's work? The, the Hebrew roots. I, I know, like going back to keeping the law and the commandments and that, but to actually want to change his name over, or doesn't it matter? Hmm. Well, to me. Uh, I, I don't insist on his name being pronounced in English. Uh, if someone says, uh, wants to say, uh, 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 Jesus, save me, or Yahshua, save me, or Jesus, save me, or however else is translated in various languages, uh, that, that's good enough for me. I mean, I, I don't think we have to, I, mean, I think God's smart enough to understand all the languages. Uh, but I do agree what you said about that particular movement is full of other heresies. Uh, but 
Brother Bill, did you post it? Oh, uh, Brother Jeff, could you read that last post he put? But thou Bethlehem, just tell me what you think of that, if you have any uh, feeling about, about that statement in that verse there. I'm here. Okay. But well, thou Bethlehem, Ephrata, thou, though thou be little amongst the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. No, I'm not familiar with this. Do you do you think from do you think the context it's in? Sorry, it's just the kind of front that at me here. All right, brother. I, I think we can conclude from from just that verse alone. Two important things. Um, we we're identifying this person as someone who is from come from Bethlehem, and we know that is Jesus. Uh, interesting thing about Bethlehem, Ephrata. Uh, I don't know where I learned this, but I believe there were actually two Bethlehems, one very, one large and one small. And this specifies the small one. And uh, that's that that's where Jesus was born in the small Bethlehem, Ephrata. Um, so it's identifying that this Jesus is referring to. And then it says he's from everlasting. It's, that's saying he's eternal. So, Brother Bill, do you do you think that we can make those conclusions from that verse? Yes, you can. I brought you some. You can conclude that, and it is lots of this. That the that the importance is at the end, from you know of old, from everlasting. There's, you can't argue away that from everlasting. You know, if you had one verse in the Bible to, and obviously everyone knew, say everyone knew that Jesus came from. Bethlehem of Fratter, and they want to know whether he's God eternal, etc., etc. That one verse spells it out. You, you can't dispute it. You know, from of old, from everlasting. It doesn't say from of old, created somewhere after eternity or, you know, midway through. It's from everlasting, right from the beginning. That was no beginning, if that makes sense. Always has and always will be everlasting. Okay, very good. I agree. Uh, let me move on to this next verse. Uh, uh, who he remains, we're going to look at in Isaiah 57, 15. Uh, and you go ahead and just post this as, as uh, we go along, if you can, Brother Bill. Um, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Uh, the commentary on this says, God has always existed and will always exist. He is eternal. Uh, Isaiah 57, 15 this, uh, the, says the, the Bible declares that God inhabiteth eternity. The word inhabiteth is in a continuing sense and means to perpetually reside or to abode. God does not live in time, in the midst of, of uh, eternity. God created 7,000 years of time with eternity stretching both before and after. One day soon, time will be no more as the eternal God will continue to inhabit his eternity. Uh, that's, that's a comment by the commentator there. And... Uh, can we conclude that from those that verse there? Uh, from let's ask Brother Jeff if he wants to respond to that first. No, I don't. I don't have nothing to say. I'm well out of my depth here. Uh, I'm, I'm just learning. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. I can't, I can't really. That's fine, brother. Brother Bill, uh, uh, is is this another proof text for the God? being eternal. This is a quality or a necessary quality of God. Yeah. There it is. Yeah, for us, Salis, you know, the high and lofty one that inhabit a fraternity. His name is Holy. I dwell in high and holy place with him 
also that is a country so is eternal you know he, he inhabits eternity you know he comes to earth which he has and he steps in and out of time as he pleases and when needed but he is out of time in the much that with him is eternal without beginning without end without a start of time without the end of time so time is a temporal measure that we can see and judge in our you know three-dimensional kind of world but god is way and beyond that so yeah he's eternal now as i'm reading this and discussing this subject i'm thinking of uh, brother sebastian dresden uh, I'm, I'm assuming he's watching now uh, he he joined me at the very beginning uh, before I went live. Just let me know he's under the weather. So I, I'm going to ask anybody watching to pray for Brother Joe Sebastian Dresden, and um, for him uh, to to feel well. Yeah, but I, I'm assuming he's watching right now. He's probably probably getting all agitated, thinking, no, no, no. It's uh, uh, there is time uh, in eternity. Um, because we, he and I have discussed that in the past. But now we're right back into this, the subject matter that twists our brains up into pretzels. When we start talking about eternity and, and, and God and all this, and that, how could God be eternal? How is it possible to have no beginning? These things really boggle our minds. But this particular commentator is saying that God inhabits eternity, and he only comes in this 7,000-year time period he, for us, I mean, he comes in and out, but he's inhabiting eternity. And and uh, I know a lot of people describe it that way. I think, Bill, you've described it that way. I, I probably have in the past. But but I'm also trying to make that fit with what I understand about the you know, one of the other qualities of God. We, knew, we know that God is omnipotent. He's all-powerful. We know that God is omniscient. He has all knowledge. But we also know that God is omnipresent. God is everywhere. And so if he's everywhere, he cannot just be existing outside of time. He has to be in time also. Uh, so do you think that if we say that God is only out of time and he comes in and out, but he doesn't exist here all the time, is that contradicting his omnipresence, Brother Bill? No, because it, it's, it, it's, it's a mind blow. You've really opened up a can of worms here. Now. <laughs> he, he is in time permanently because he, he is time in that sense, but out of time as well because he's omnipresent. You know, we're, we're trying to think laterally. We're trying to think with our mere human capabilities. And, and so God is so beyond that. That's why, you know, we have to, you know, we have to conclude he's in time, yeah, because he created time, but he's also out of time in as much as he's not constrained by time. You know, God didn't exist because time existed. Time existed because God existed. Yeah, it's a real, it's a real mind blower. But I, I didn't see both angles. Yes, he's in time, but also, yes, he's out of time, being the creator of time. Well, I'd, I'd say that, that time exists because man exists, doesn't it? God, God doesn't really need a watch. I mean, if I was the only person on the planet, I wouldn't need a watch, would I? Because I wouldn't have to look at the time to, to match up with yours. So that there's God's communication with man, isn't it? So if he was alone, he, he was never alone. I mean, that's why there's one God in three persons. Uh, the way that i see it that uh, you had father son holy spirit and then more and more people have been added to the circle yeah but he was never actually alone or inside or outside of time it so uh, could even drift into quantum physics there quantum mechanics that, that um you know matter it, it's i don't want don't, don't, don't to go deep on this but Really, if you look at it on the on the quantum level, that we're there's billions of particles, and there is no individual sin, then is there? Because there is no me, there is no God, there is no concept of God, there is nothing. If if quantum theory, if there is any truth to it, because it's a man-made concept, yeah. 
like um, slain from the foundation of the world. Or I mentioned a bit earlier, like uh, how can God get angry when he when he's outside of time and he knows everything from the beginning? So I, what did I say, Bill? I said if I spill my coffee on you and you knew that I was going to spill my coffee, you're not going to jump up and scream and say, "Look at this! You're going to pay for the dry cleaning bill." Okay. Yeah. Hey, Brother Bill, I'm not the only one that's twisting brains around. Brother Jeff's twisting our brain too. Oh no, no, this is, this is a real brain twister today. Yeah. Uh, you yeah, know, it's uh, uh, to anybody watching, you know, we, we don't claim that we can uh, explain everything perfectly. Uh, we're, we're just trying to understand it as best we can. And even in, when we get into eternity, into uh, this uh, state uh, that uh, we call the eternal kingdom of God, the new heavens and the new earth, and we, we're, we, I believe that we'll, we'll understand a lot more, but man's never going to be omniscient. Only God is omniscient. So we'll always be uh, lacking in certain knowledge. But uh, to me, it's, it's one of the most exciting things in my life. I didn't appreciate it when I was really young. But as I've gotten older, one of the things I appreciate the most is, is learning things. And uh, so it's, it's a real learning experience we're going through. Let's go to the next uh, verse here. This is a, uh-oh, oh no. <laughs> okay. Uh, now we're starting a new phase of this whole study. Everything we've done up to this point was to prove that one attribute of God is eternality. God is eternal. If he's not eternal, he can't be God. And and that uh, and Jesus is God, as he said, as the scriptures say, and he is eternal, as the scriptures say. If he was not eternal, he couldn't be God. So we've spent basically six now, now another hour, we spent basically seven hours establishing this as a fact. And uh, if someone doesn't agree that God is eternal and Jesus is eternal God Almighty, then I would say, then uh, it's been nice knowing you, but uh, I can't have fellowship with you if you can't accept that fact. If you think that Jesus is a creature, a creature means that you were created. You had a beginning point. So uh, if that's how you see Jesus, then uh, you're not what I would call a, a, a Christian. So uh, now we're going to move on to the real a subject matter that I found fascinating that really relates more, even more so, to what Brother Sebastian Dresden has uh, caused us to talk about by his video and his questions. And that is, uh, how did Jesus exist before the incarnation? He, he says that uh, perhaps uh, Jesus existed in God, in the Father, as the same substance, the same essence, but he was in it, in him eternally, and he came out of him just as Eve existed inside Adam as the rib, and he, she was brought out of Adam, but she pre-existed in Adam. And so God took the rib out, and he, it was formed into Eve, and uh, so he, he uses that as a comparison. Well, it's an interesting theory, and uh, we even brought up the subject that uh, what about not just Eve, but and uh, the question of Jesus, did he come out of the substance of God? Uh, but what about just all of creation, all of matter? We talked about matter earlier. Where did matter come from? If, if the only thing that existed was God, and then God created everything, he couldn't have created it from some other stuff because no other stuff existed. He did it, it had to come out of him. Uh, that's what I think. And therefore, if all of creation came out of God, uh, some people will extrapolate and say, well, that means that creation is God. That's what we could call pantheism, and, and we are not pantheists. We don't worship the creation. I admire the creation. I'm, I'm just in awe of the creation. But I don't worship the creation. I worship the creator who made it all, and that's God. But did this matter? Did their time, matter, energy come out of God? Um, so now the question is eternal sonship. Did Jesus eternally exist 
as the son of God, uh, or did he e exist before he, the incarnation? Did he, he was eternal, but did he have this position or status as the son of God eternally? That is the question. And we're going to go into two schools of thought and look at them both and try to be fair. And, and by the time we're done, several weeks from now, <laughs> maybe, maybe you can be confident in your conclusion. We'll see. Um, first, let me, before I go into it, just get your reaction to that, each of you. Uh, Brother Jeff. Uh, yeah, okay. I would see the, the, there's a, a, a lot to think about there. Um, no, God said there'll be light and it, it, speaking things into existence. Yeah. The Alan Watts, have you ever heard of Alan Watts? He's, he's trying to uh, metaphysics. Okay, he says that we're, we're all kind of God, we're, we're the universe kind of is, is like a ball with uh, apertures in it, thousands of pinholes, and that's what we are, yeah? We're just the light. If you imagine, imagine a sphere with a lamp in the middle, with a light bulb in the middle, yeah? With thousands of pinholes and the light shining through it, then that's us it's all pure energy uh, working at, at one pure energy force with god not not having a mind not not kind of we, we're all god this is real new age flaky stuff this in the metaphysical realm but but uh no i'll, I'll give bill the old questions this afternoon if if god knows that i'm going to have porridge for breakfast then i haven't got free will yeah if he doesn't, then he doesn't know everything. Okay, so there, there's two conflicting doctrines. Yeah. And um, I know I'm straying. So. That, that brother, that question is very simply answered with just the concept of foreknowledge. Because, because God knows something's going to happen does not mean that he is making it happen. So he understands because he's out, he sees time in a timeline like that. So he can see everything that's ever happened, and he knows what you're going to that you're going to decide to have porridge. And because he knows it's going to happen, doesn't mean that you didn't decide for it to happen. But that's another subject. And uh, let me ask Brother Bill to just comment about what I said. Now, where we're going next, Brother Bill, uh, the subject of eternal sonship. Just give me your first reaction to that. Well, I've been I've been looking at the notes. I've been going through all the notes while you've been talking. Uh, to me, to me personally, I believe it's fundamental: the eternal sonship, you know, the eternity of Christ being God, and, and just simply because uh, the fact that only God can forgive sins. If Christ was not eternally God, then no sins would be forgiven. If He was a created or, or a promoted creature to become a son, then he's not God. And he had to be God for, for, for our all, you know, time and moral, he had to be God. You know, that, that's what I believe in, and I believe that it's essential, for me personally. Okay, uh, yeah, that, that's something that I laid out as a, a premise in the very first statement I made, uh, uh, you know, seven hours and three minutes ago you know, in, in this study. Um, that that uh, in my statement of faith, I say that Jesus is eternal God Almighty. Uh, Jesus is eternal God Almighty, manifest in the flesh as the Son of God. And if, if that's uh, that's something that uh, if someone does not accept the eternality of Jesus, that they think he's a creature and had a beginning point, he was created, then that is not Christianity, and uh, that's part of our core doctrines. Uh, so yes, yeah, we 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 agree with that. We've proven that for seven hours now. Now we're moving on and asking, okay, before the incarnation, before the name Jesus appears in the scriptures, he existed eternally. But how did he exist? Did and and did he he exist with a different name and a different title, a different role? 
or was he always existing in the same name, title, and role throughout eternity past as the Son of God? That's what we're going to explore next. So let's begin that. Um, through, throughout church history, the doctrine of eternal sonship has been widely held with most Christians believing that Jesus existed as God's eternal son before creation. It is affirmed in the Nicene Creed in 325 AD, which states, quote, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit. He became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And his kingdom will have no end, unquote. That's the Nicene Creed. It was also later reaffirmed in the fifth century in the Athanasian Creed. So I guess the Athanasian Creed is similar in stating the same thing. Uh, so this is uh, the idea that he has existed eternally in this same title and role and function as the son. So that's what we're going to be uh, asking about now. Uh, so let me just ask you to respond to this Nicene Creed, what's uh, stated and, and we learn from that. Uh, first, Brother Jeff. Bill, Bill, will you post that? Could you post that creed in the comment section here? Yeah, we recited the creed today. We went to a high Anglican church, but uh, one being with the Father, it's one in being, being, being. One in. Can we can we move on to the cross? What was when when jesus said my god my god why have you forsaken me uh several years ago i, I learned that uh, the the spirit and the father turned their back on him he was the only one ever to experience separation from god now uh, after further study a few years on i've more come come to the uh, belief that the father the son and the spirit were hanging on that cross and my god my god why hast thou forsaken me was our words um, what's your take on that hmm. i don't uh, let's let's come back to that uh, that question yeah uh go ahead and mute your mic for a second okay yeah uh let, let's come back to that in, in a minute uh I, i've never heard that theory uh but i'd like to get uh bill's reaction to the nicene creed and uh is there a, do you think the nicene creed is uh perfect uh, uh do you have any issues with it or you, could you say that you could post that creed as as your own creed yeah i i, I believe yeah i 100 percent believe the nicene creed yeah and the vast majority of scriptures you know would agree with that also obviously we're going to get the the, the odd scripture that that seems to contradict that and there are peculiar scriptures but on the whole you know all the scriptures uh, that the Noah's seen creed is correct it, it goes along with the, the scriptural premise yeah. I see something I mean, I cannot disagree with one word of it, really, um, but I do see that there is something missing that I would not be satisfied. 
And uh, I'm wondering if you, if it stands out to you like it does to me as a sore thumb. Could you take another look and see if there's anything that's glaring omission? I'm still reading that. You've obviously noticed something I haven't noticed yet. If you get down to the part, uh, it, it certainly declares the facts. It says he came for our salvation. And then it, then it lists all the facts. All, all the events, and they're all true. And we, we, we believe all those things. But at no point does that Nicene Creed, Creed declare the means of our salvation is through faith in this person and what he's done for us. I'd like to have that more clearly stated and understood in the, in the creed. And that's, that's why in my creed, I, I, in my statement of faith, I say salvation is a free gift offered to everyone. We, we receive it through faith alone in Christ alone. So uh, do, you, do you think I'm nitpicking on that, brother? Or is that, uh... well, yeah, well, some people may get confused. Yeah, so I'm okay with that, perhaps because I'm English and we're, we're used to that at the creed, because you initially have to have faith in this God, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, to even take note of the creed in the first place. So or faith is almost a default within that. But I also understand your point that, you know, if, if you know, England has got a long history of these creeds and, and things, and, and it's almost, you know, up until my generation and and generations now so previous generations to me would have known this and it would have been common commonly known amongst the peoples and, and it's it, the faith in this was just as, as a given an assumption but mm -hmm. that's probably because we have the his, history a historical bias in that regard but yeah but if you're if you're somebody who hasn't come from a culture or a country uh, and have the same scenario that we have here then you, yeah, you would probably need to add faith in there. Mm -hmm. Well, I would, I've would. i made this point countless times uh, in my previous videos. Um, I asked, in one video I said, I got a question that uh, Roman Catholics believe in the gospel as stated in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. They, you ask any Roman Catholic, do you believe all of these facts are true? Uh, and then uh, if you read this creed, had a Roman Catholic read the, uh, that creed, and you said, do you believe every word is true? And they'll say yes. And then I follow up and say, well, do you believe you're going to go to heaven? And if so, why? Um, the Roman Catholic is not going to say, well, it's because of the creed, because he, he died for my sins and he's, he's, he's my savior. The, the Roman Catholic is going to, even though they believe all those facts, they do not relate those facts as, as the solution for their salvation. They still think that their salvation is based upon uh, personal merit by, by, by being religious. So that's, that's where I see the, the problem in it. Now let me ask you to respond to that. Then we want to ask, then we want to delve into Brother Jeff's question about the cross and, and forsaking. But first, please answer that, Brother Bill. Well, yeah, yeah. In that, in that case, you know, it is, it is lacking in that, that respect because, yeah, mo most people within Christendom, unless you're a, a oneness, Pentecostal or something, or, 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 you know, some other cult, would, would agree with that. But, yeah, fundamentally, I think the creed is, is more of a statement of truths and facts as opposed to a salvific message. So, yeah, the, the creed is good. But as a salvific message, it's no good because you need to know the facts before that. You're saved by faith alone, your grace alone, Christ alone. So, yeah, that, that, but yeah, yeah if, if you was to have a modern day updated creed, because we're in a totally different era to, you know, 100, 200 years ago, 
you know, there's there's people out there now, you know, who don't know the meaning of Christmas, don't know the meaning of Easter, especially in this country. It'd be useless to them, mm -hmm. you know, because it's it, it, and there's no explanation in there how to be saved. Mm -hmm. So just believing those historical facts there, and, and the facts that Jesus is God and so is the Father and so is the Holy Ghost, that still isn't enough to get you saved. You have to believe on the Christ. And the very same Christ you have to believe by faith alone in. So mm -hmm. yeah, that, that would be lacking today. Okay, I, so uh, you, you you agree that uh, I think the way you termed it was was perfect. It's it's a it's a great decree of, of of the facts about Jesus and God and what He's done, but it's not a salvific message because it's lacking the the the, the whole concept that this is how you get saved. <laughs> you know. Um, now let me let's get to uh, brother Jeff's question about the cross and uh, be, Jesus saying or this in the scriptures it says my God my God why hast thou forsaken me uh, you heard the question in his premise uh, let me get your response to that first brother Bill well there's loads of theological thoughts and ideals in regard to that I, I per, this is me personally it is believed that, that that because Christ became sin for us, that, that that God looked upon Christ and saw the sin of the world because it was laid upon Christ. So it wasn't God forsaken Jesus Christ per se. It was God forsaken the sin that Christ bore upon him and, and disposed of it for us. That's how I see it. So it wasn't Christ being forsaken. It was the sin that he was bearing that was being forsaken. Because it even tells you in a, um, Hebrews eight twelve, you know he says, "For I'll be I'll be merciful to their, I'll be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more." So we get a hint even from there that that God isn't going to remember these sins and iniquities anymore because they're all laid upon Christ, and, and God forsook the sin that was upon Christ. That's how I see it. Okay, uh, this this is just another one of uh, I would say hundreds of great questions that are worth discussing, and, and uh, we we may not be able to figure it out. We may not even be able to agree, but it's uh, it's beneficial to to uh, make an attempt. Uh, I've always understood that that this forsaking. Well, first let me say that a person who reads that the first time, and they do not understand. Uh, that uh, this was the plan of God. Be become flesh, and the Word would become flesh, and as Jesus and die on the cross for our sins. So, uh, if we understand that, we we shouldn't be thinking that. Well, gee, uh, why is Jesus uh, saying? Why have you forsaken me? I mean, he does, does he not want to die? And he's, he thinks God's forsaken him because he's actually letting him suffer and die on the cross. This is how a person could react to it if they don't understand the whole context of the, the plan of salvation. But what I've, uh, when you understand this in context, then, then you, you would have to, I always thought that God does the Father, the Holy Spirit, does forsake him spiritually in terms of there is a, because there's sin on him. And sin is, uh, uh, man is separated from God because of sin. Jesus didn't have any sin until he took ours on. So before that, you know, God could have fellowship with him because he had no sin. And, and so if sin is a barrier, as I've always thought and taught, that the the barrier between man and God was our sin nature and our sinful acts. God couldn't have fellowship with us. He want, he had to resolve that. We couldn't resolve on our own. That's why he had to step in and solve the problem through his birth, death, burial, and resurrection. But once that was done, the barrier, the sin barrier was removed. The curtain, curtain in the temple was torn and opened up. That curtain separated so that people didn't couldn't go into the Holy of Holies and have access to God. But now the curtain was torn open, 
illustrating that now we all have access to God. We're, we're, there's no more barrier. There's no more curtain prohibiting us. So I think that uh, what happened is before Jesus took on our sins, there was no barrier between him and his father and the Holy Spirit. But once he took on the sin, there was a barrier there. And they, they did forsake him in that respect spiritually. But they didn't forsake him in the sense that some people think he's complaining about being crucified and dying. It's the fellowship of the, the Father and the Holy Spirit with Jesus that he was complaining about. Oh, I'm forsaken here. You've left me. I'm, uh, I don't want to be, uh, I, I don't have fellowship now because of sin. That's how I see it. Now, the way as far as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all being on the cross with him, I've never heard it stated before, but it does fit with the, the concept of omnipresence, as I stated earlier. I got in trouble with one person years ago because, you know, um, uh, I was talking about God's omnipresence, that he's everywhere. I said, God is even in hell. And they said, no, God's not in hell. I said, well, then he's got not, not omnipresent. He's, he's, he's present everywhere except hell. That means he's not omnipresent. So if he's omnipresent and he's even existed in hell and, and everywhere, then he must have also existed within the body of Jesus too. Otherwise, we're going to say he's omnipresent except he didn't exist in that body. Um, so I, um, let me ask uh, uh, Brother Jeff. to You've heard Bill and me respond to your question. Uh, what's your reaction to that, Brother Jeff? Um, my reaction would be uh, uh, another question. So, I mean, but when um, when Jesus died, gave up the ghost, who was left hanging on the cross? Was that us? Because he went to preach to the spirits in prison because the barrier had been removed, as you say, that, that God was then able to, to uh, approach us like Jesus being the bridge between God and man Be because of our unrighteousness we were separated so now Christ is our good works and it's an absolute changeover yeah like uh, I had a question the other day that like some somebody asked me um how could anyone have been saved during the time of Jesus's death and resurrection because God was dead i mean god wasn't dead he was he was alive so who was who was that body hanging on the cross he'd be made sin for us yeah uh, god's wrath was satisfied jesus gave up the ghost was that still jesus is there, there couldn't have been god's body being put in the tomb yeah so th this this body must have been us okay or, or just take it personally that was me hanging there be, be, to um jesus being the god man is his deity be, being man and god at the same exactly the same time must have been given up yeah at his death when he gave up the ghost okay so, so then he's going to be everywhere at once. So he would have been in the body, but not in the body. Am I, am I making any sense here? Well, I, I'm tempted to say you get one question. I mean, you asked a question that went off totally to a different subject, and I, I wanted to answer the question. But if we do all the follow-up questions, then we're no longer on this study anymore. Uh, so uh, I, I would just answer as quickly as I can that uh, uh, on the cross, uh, that was Jesus' body. It was still his, his body, but he was not occupying it. Uh, and as far as us being up there with him, there is scripture that says that uh, we were crucified with Christ. So in that sense it was, but really it's our sins that were put on him. But spiritually, it's, it's as though we were, we were crucified and buried and rose with him. Um, Brother Bill, uh, first respond to, to your, get your reaction to what I said about his original question. Uh, you answered it, and then I answered it. I'd, get, I'd like to get your feedback on that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll tell you, today seems to be opening the can of worms, Dave. We're going, we're going real, 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 real heavy, deep meat here. And I, I still, this is still my opinion. You know, I still believe that, 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 that God forsook 
the sin that was upon Christ, not the Christ himself. Because like I said, you mentioned the sin is the barrier between man and God. And when when all the sins of the world were placed on Christ, there was a barrier then. So it wasn't, as you say, I think we're agreeing, but it coming from different angles. You know, it was, it was what I believe it was the father forsaken the, the sin that was on Christ because he had to bear the sins of the whole world that day. So Father God couldn't bear the sight of sin and, and forsook the sin that was on Christ, but not the son. That's, that's how I still see it. I think we're probably saying the same thing, but from a slightly different perspective. Yeah, I don't. I don't really see a difference in, in what you said uh, in the, the way I described it. So I, I, I would think we're in agreement on that. Uh, now, do you want to respond to his follow-up question about uh, um, who was that? That was that really Jesus' uh, body, and or is that was us? Was that us on the cross? You heard the question. Yeah, I, I still believe that was Christ's body. On the cross as well, because it is the hypostatic union, and that's a mystery itself. That that Jesus was a one hundred percent man, i.e., that body on the cross, but also one hundred percent God spiritually at the same time. So you know, no, you know, when he was placed in the tomb, uh, and, and and it says that Christ descended to the belly of the earth, didn't he? He preached to those in the prisons because we weren't in the tomb. It doesn't say whether he went down in his body or went down spiritually in that sense. So he could have been taken off the cross, laid in the tomb, then his body, so the whole hypostatic union itself, could have descended into the prison and, and preached in the prisons and then come up again and then obviously was resurrected. So, yeah, that's, that's, that's a real deep question. But I, I suppose I'd, I'd err on the side of orthodoxy and to say that, yeah, that was still... Christ physically on the cross. Yeah, well, I, it, it doesn't have to be. I mean, doesn't the scripture say that he was crucified? He was buried. So it, it has to be him uh, on the cross, and it has to be his dead body, but it has to be him in the tomb. Um, do, you, do you want to respond to the, the point that it was us um, in terms of the scriptures? I don't know the scriptures, but I'm familiar with some scriptures that were, where people te are teaching that we were actually crucified with Christ. Do you, are, do you know those scriptures, brother? You know what I'm referring to? Uh, sir, me? You no, know, I was asking Bill, but you can, if you know them, go ahead. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I have no response to that. No, so you pass over to Bill. All right, Bill? You still there, Bill? Hmm. I hope we, uh, maybe we lost him. Oh. Yeah, oh, I'm back again. I'm back again. Yeah. Did you hear yeah, the question? Just, no, can you repeat the question? I'd quickly pop out just for a second. If I can remember it. Oh, yeah. No. I'm not sure I even remember the question. Okay. We've, uh, we've spent enough time um, on that. Oh, yeah. I was just asking you if you're familiar with the, the actual verses that would support. The idea that we were crucified with Christ. Yeah, no, I, I do know the verses. I can't chapter and verse. I can't give you off the top of my head. But yeah, it, where it says, you know, it's no longer I that live, but Christ. You know, I've been crucified with Christ. You know that those verses. So yeah, I, I'm aware of them, but not chapter and verse at the second. Yeah. Uh, so that's the thing, Bill. Or, I mean, Jeff, where a person could say you are correct that that's us on the cross. Uh, but I wouldn't say that's us, not him, and, and I'm not sure I'd even say uh, us. It's not us physically. It's a spiritual way of saying things. That uh, uh, it's, it's one of those things like I'm seated with Christ already. I don't. I'm, I think I'm here, but the scripture says I'm, I'm. I'm not. I'm already in heavenly places. So uh, let's move on. Uh, now. Uh, now, here's, here's the question. Um, no eternal sonship, and that is, uh, those who hold this view see the sonship of Christ as not being an essential part of who he is. Uh, 
but instead see it as simply being a role or a title or function that Christ assumed at his incarnation. They also teach that the Father became the Father at the time of incarnation. Throughout history, many conservative Christians have denied the doctrine of eternal sonship. Some examples would be Ralph Wardlaw, Adam Clark, Albert Barnes, Finnis J. Dake, Walter Martin. So first of all, uh, before we get into the meat of this, all this subject here, let me just repeat this one thing and I'll just get your reaction. Now, you may have a, already an opinion. Uh, you may have a, a firm opinion on this already. But between the next uh, probably, I would say, uh, maybe 10 hours of study that we're going to be doing over the next few weeks, we're going to be thoroughly examining both sides of this question. And I don't know if by the time we're done, you know, how you're going to see this. But this is the question. Those who hold this view, no eternal sonship, see the sonship of Christ as not being an essential part of who he is, but instead see it sim as simply being a role or a title or a function that Christ assumed at his incarnation. They also teach that the Father became the Father at the time of the Incarnation. Throughout history, many conservative Christians have denied the doctrine of eternal sonship. So we're going to go into this first part is going to be taking the other side of this, that no, eternal sonship is the correct viewpoint. And then when we're, we've exhausted that study, we're going to look at the other side of it, who, those people who agree with us that this point that no, his, 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 he did not eternally exist as the son. Uh, he is eternal, but he took on this role of son at the incarnation. And at that's the time when the father became the father, because without a son, he wouldn't be a father. Okay. Uh, so that's the, the question that we're going to be analyzing over the next few weeks. I want your first reaction to that. Um, Brother Bill? Yeah, obviously, obviously, I fundamentally disagree with, you know, that their premise and that lot. And you know, I'm actually a little bit shocked that Dr. Walt Martin uh, took that uh, theological stance because you know he has got some good writings, but to me, you know, that that well, that's heresy. So I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit taken back that that he would would, would uh, that much to to say something. And, and I already know because. Quoted often times to me, it's Hebrews 1 5 is the verse they use all the time, you know, but they forget to use, you know, Hebrews 1 8 and the vast majority of all scriptures to prove that, that Jesus was eternally son. But that is a very tricky, very tricky verse that they use, and, and I assume that's going to come up in this debate. Well, uh, you're starting off with a very strong opinion on this. And uh, I'll be curious to see uh, by the time we're all done, uh, if you change your opinion or if your opinion is, is weakened in, in any way, uh, time will tell. Uh, Brother, Brother Jeff, what's your reaction to this first premise that we're, we're laying here? No, I haven't got a lot to say on that. I, I would say that the, the, I wouldn't, I'm not sure it, it, if I call that heresy, but it, it, it's the, the Father, Son, and, and Spirit is, is for our benefit, yeah? It's only for our, our little finite minds. And as you said earlier, it's something that we're never going to really know. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm just sort of covering up my own ignorance, basically, yeah, really. <laughs> All right. Okay, so we have uh, Jeff and Bill right now, and, and they're in kind of different camps. Uh, Bill is str strongly uh, um, uh, against this idea that he, he believes in etern the eternal sonship. Uh, Brother Jeff is saying that, that this is just something that is for our benefit and, and that uh, he's not uh, believing that it's, uh, uh, it w would move into the cross the line into heresy. Um, what, I, what I believe is that I wasn't even familiar with this question until Brother Sebastian Dresden uh, made his video, posed, these, posed some questions that caused me to look into some of these things. And I realized, hey, there, here's a very interesting question. At, at my point right now, 
I'm I, I'm not as uh, strongly against this as as Bill is. I'm probably more in line with uh, what what Jeff is, is saying. Uh, I'm not really sure yet. This point, I've read all the notes ahead. I've seen already both sides of this, but I want to you know reserve my conclusions until I'm done. Uh, and we've had a chance to really examine this both ways. And I, I suspect that even when I'm done, I might not be sure. But I don't think either side would, would rise to the what I would call a heresy at all, uh, because both sides agree that Jesus existed eternally. It's just that one side says he, he existed as the Son. The other side said, no, he existed. There was still a trinity. But the father-son relationship wasn't established. There was no need for it. But there was three persons. Maybe there are, you know, they, they have different titles, you know, but uh, different. But the role of being son. This is another thing that's interesting too. That this sub subordinate position that Jesus took on as son. And, and uh, the question is, was he always subordinate, uh, or or or, or were, was there no subordinate relationship? Uh, in times past, uh, his incarnation, but at the, when he became son, he, he became subordinate and the father became the father. So this is where we're going to be going forward with this. Let me see if we can go much into this and or if this is a good time to. Uh, um, good time to consider. Um, I would say that this is probably a good time to stop and let, we, let's let's uh, do our uh, invitation and uh, uh, let me ask you about your your question in the very beginning, brother. Uh, is, is that totally irrelevant to our subject when you talked about your experience in church today and your uh, the message? Is that something we should reserve for uh, after the study? Uh, I, I hate to have a a theme, and then uh, the the theme is, is not, not consistent for the whole video. I'd like to have the whole video about this theme, but if you don't think it's too far off basis, and or it's not going to require a totally different uh, uh, con uh, subject matter, I don't know. I guess the subject matter. Yeah. No, no. I think I think that's fine if we if we if we speak about this, you know, when, when we go offline, because. Okay, but let's uh, let's talk privately uh, about yours, and maybe maybe we'll even want to turn that into a video if we feel that the subject is is uh, interesting enough that we want to make it into a, a video or, or a, you know a formal hangout. But I, I'm curious to see what you learned in church today, and uh, uh, but I, I believe this is a a nice place to stop for today, even though we're probably like ten minutes early because we're going to take about ten minutes to talk about salvation. So that'll leave us about 10 minutes short of the normal two hour show. But I, I'd like to stop here because it's kind of like a cliffhanger. I, I don't want to go too far into this. Plus I'd like to have uh, brother Joe uh, with us. I'm sure he'll be with us next time. Uh, I'm assuming that his uh, feeling bad is just a very short temporary thing. Um, all right, so let me ask you each to do this. Uh, one at a time, just, give a, a little summary of your thoughts about the subject today. Uh, and, and then after we're done with that, uh, we're going to discuss salvation a little bit. Uh, Brother brother Jeff, what did you think of the discussion today? I found it very, very difficult at first. It, it, it was something that uh, I had to kind of tune my head into. Because, you know, you know like uh, the the running the middle day of a christian is uh, i mean i've been through eschatology and uh preterism and, and sort of uh, did, did jesus return in 70 a.d and then go and see bill and then i found out no it's not and then we go smashing down dispensationalism and then we go to the new world order and who's the antichrist and then i come home from church and then i got on here and now we're going into deep stuff and it, it I've just tuned in, and now we're going off on something else. So, you know, like uh, I used to just watch the Waltons, you know. <laughs> but but I really enjoyed it. I've enjoyed it, but I, I think that it's nice to 
for for me starting in a hangout like this one to uh to to get used to it here but but i i'm just being, i found it very difficult to stay on subject yeah because because I, I'm I'm kind of I'm kind of like butterfly, D different scriptures and doctrines, and then then you you, you suddenly you, you come with the, the question like uh, if you could only have one book of the Bible, which would which would it be? And the top of the head, my head flew off because, because the sermon at Smells and Bells Day, the High Anglican Church, was he was talking about. Uh, you don't read it as a novel from beginning to end. It, it, it's plural. Bible means books, yeah. And I thought, oh, I didn't know that. I thought the Bible meant, you know, that's the book. And I knew how it's been put together. I knew that the apocrypha had been taken out. And the vastness of what there is to know, it, it, it's, it, it just goes on and on and on. So, so now, now I've just got the hang of this, okay. And now, now we're winding it, winding it down. But um, you know, it's a lovely way to, way to finish off finish off the day. It, it's... Okay, brother. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I, I first of all, Jeff, I, I, I'm really glad you were uh, with us today. Uh, you asked some interesting questions, even though we, uh, well, you know, we don't mind varying off for a little while to something else. Uh, I do, uh, I do like my uh, hangouts, just the show, to be structured. But I don't want to be so rigid that we don't we can't have fun discussing other things too, uh, as long as we can get back to the, the topic at uh, the, the hand. Uh, but you, I don't think, brother, you, you give yourself quite enough credit for. Uh, um, see, the the way that you're uh, saying, well, gee, I don't know. This is like blowing my mind. Guess what? This this whole study now for about eight hours so far, four four shows, two hours each. This whole show has been doing this to all of us because this particular type of subject is really mind-boggling, and I, I think that uh, you've done you did very well, and I'm really glad that you participated. So I hope that you will be like on the edge of your seat, anxious to come in next week and pick up and, and go, go headlong into this next phase of the study. So I hope you can do that. Uh, I'm going to ask Brother Bill to give a little account of today. Uh, this study, and then we'll do uh, an invitation for salvation. Yep, yep. So my account of the studies. First of all, I just like to say on an amusing note, it's nothing like chucking someone in the deep end, and that's what we done to Jeff today. <laughs> but that's a good thing. Jeff managed to float; he didn't drown. And and if Jeff can handle this this deep subject and the amount of can of worms, you know, the worms were open and left, right, and centre in this subject is amazing. If you can handle that, you know, it's, it's, I'll tell you, you're going to be a soldier of Christ for sure, because you, you can't get much deeper than what we're talking about the last few weeks. So that's on that note. But, yeah, also, obviously, yeah, interesting study. And, again, we're, we're at the point where you know, what was supposed to probably be about two hangouts, because the depth of this discussion and, and it, it, what it entails, like I said, we, we're going to be lucky if it's done in 10, 12 hours. You know, and, and the, yeah, on the cliffhanger, I, I can see, like I said, Hebrews 1 5 and Hebrews 1 8 coming out. And I, I'm going to have to get some extra study notes done because that you're hitting some real deep verses there. Uh, all right, brother. Uh, the, the, as usual, it's I, I always enjoy the hangouts, all the different topics and characters that we've been studying. And, and, and this one, as you said, is it, very deep. This is not milk, uh, uh, and uh, um, for a person to even to begin to understand these things, I think that they had to drink their milk and get indwelled and sealed with the Holy Spirit so the Holy Spirit can help them understand these deeper things. And even then, we see through uh, a glass that's, how does how's the verse go? It's a, a, that's a smoky. We can't see clearly through it. Um, and uh, someday we'll be able to see more clearly in eternity. Um, but yeah, the, the scripture talks about milk and meat, and this is a meaty subject, not meant for someone who doesn't have uh, received the milk. Now, now the milk, we won't tell people um, how to get that milk. 
and, and, the, and you get born again. And when you're born again, you got to have the milk. And then as you grow and mature, you're, you're ready for these meaty subjects, these deeper things that are more difficult. So Brother Bill, if someone's watching right now, and they're now they're interested in the Bible, they're interested in Jesus and Christianity. And, but the first thing, before we go feed the hungry, before we clothe people, before we do all these wonderful works, uh, what has to be happen first? Because what good is it to do good deeds and to serve mankind, and then they, they die without salvation? Don't you think the first and utmost thing of importance is to tell them how to be saved, tell them how to have eternal life in heaven? And if that, you think that's the most important, then that we, we don't want to neglect it. So I would ask Brother Bill, as an evangelist, um, tell him this good news. Well, the first bit of good news, and I'm going to slightly different to what I've been generally doing, but the same, is that I think it's important just to recall yeah, an apostle's words. Uh, and it will make sense in a minute. Uh, this is the apostle Paul. He wrote a, a letter or a small letter, which is known as an epistle, to, to Timothy. And he says... This is a faithful saying and worthy of all exception that Jesus, this is Christ Jesus, came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Now that is the sum of all things, that, that, that Christ didn't come to earth to stay in a manger. He didn't come to earth to give us good, sound and godly advice, although he did that. He came into the world with one distinct purpose. And that was to save people from eternal separation, which is caused by sin. That was the whole sum of all things. This is why Jesus come. Now, the word says that, that we're all sinners, every single one, you know, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, the word says. All right. And unfortunately, because of this sin, you know, God is holy and perfect and we're not. He loves us dearly, but he hates the sinner as upon us. And the unfortunate thing is the wages of this sin, I what how this sin ends for us who don't know Christ, is death, which is eternal separation from a loving God. You know, but the good news is this day is, you know, despite the fact we're all sinners, despite the fact we're not holy and perfect and we can never meet God's standards, you know, the, the, the good news is that, that Christ loves us dearly and he actually came to earth to become our sin. So he came to earth to die at Calvary and all the sin, as we described earlier in this hangout, all the sin of the whole world was placed upon, you know, upon Jesus Christ that day, you know, for the sake of us and for the sake because he loves us. He wants to be with us. He wants fellowship with us, but he can't have fellowship with sin itself. And that is the, the sum of all things. You know, and, and if you want to know, you know, how you can be saved, how you can, you know, have eternal life with Christ and 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 come away from you know being disenfranchised with God and have fellowship with him again uh, the, the answer is, is quite simple and, and the Bible says uh, it's recorded you know clearly in scripture you know where, where Paul and Silas you know they was they was locked up in prison and there was an earthquake and and, and strange things happened and, and the, one of the, the prison guard you know it was a Philippine jailer was just about to kill himself, you know, and they told him not to, basically. And he says to them, because he obviously knew, because he obviously heard him singing and praying, you know, he says to them, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? You know, not what should I do or could I do? He was straight to the point, what must, what is the, the bare minimum I need to do to be saved? And the apostle said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. How simple is that? You know, many people on YouTube, you know, watching this live now or maybe watching it later on have, have bumped into religious people and, and they burden you with things that you've got to do to be saved. You've got to repent of your sins. You've got to live a good life. You've got to pay tithes. You've got to, you know, be a better person. You've got to go on some self, you know, holy self-improvement scheme. That's religionity and that will kill you. That will send you to hell. All you need to do is believe on this Jesus Christ who paid for all your sins, took all the sin that you've ever done, will do, and to the moment you die upon his shoulders at Calvary. If you believe on this Jesus Christ, the one who took your sin and died for, 
the one who was buried, and the one who rose again, victorious over death, sin and hell, if you was to believe on this Jesus Christ, then you will be saved. So I would implore anyone out there, you know, forget about any preconceptions you may have of God. You know, we're giving you a clear gospel message from the heart of Christ himself, straight from the scriptures. We're not making this stuff up. Get yourself a Bible. Look, you know, it just says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shall be saved. And I would encourage anyone out there today just to do that. Take that little step of faith because that's how we're saved. We're saved by grace through faith. You know, we're not saved by works. We're not saved by being good or doing penance. We're saved by just taking that 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 little step of faith and entrusting this Jesus Christ who is there and waiting with open arms to save you this day. So I implore again, believe on this Jesus we preach because he is the one who will save and he will save to the utmost. Mm, yeah, hallelujah. Um, that is good news, and I, obviously it's 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 even better than just good news. I mean, you hear good news a lot of times in your life, but that's the best news. That uh, I think it's uh, important for people to understand that uh, the when when the the word believe on the Lord Jesus, uh, what what does it really mean? I made a video titled believe defined because uh, sadly in this millennium uh, people are taking basic words out of the bible and giving them new meanings false meanings we've seen that with a lot of different words and i think believe is one that is uh, misused and in that video i make the point that believe does not mean that uh that uh, you you do some kind of acts like change your life, uh, turn over a new leaf, uh, become a religious person, follow some set of religious rules. Those words are not related at all to believing. The words that are related to, to believing is, is uh, trust Jesus. Believe on Jesus means to depend on Jesus. Believe on Jesus means to rely upon Jesus. See, the... Romans 10.3 tells us that the problem with the world is that man is trying to establish their own righteousness instead of accepting the righteousness of God. And this is the issue. Do you believe that you can get to heaven through your own efforts? That's what the scriptures mean when you're establishing your own righteousness. You say, if I get good enough, God will accept me. That's the biggest error. That's the biggest mistake. Of all, of all mankind, do not believe in yourself. Do not put your faith in your own ability. Don't put your faith in your own performance. You need to change your mind and understand that you can't do it, and that's why you need to be saved. I mean, if you could do it, you wouldn't need to be saved. Jesus wouldn't have to save you. Since we can't do it, can't establish our own righteousness to a level that God will accept, which is perfection, the only alternative is that we believe in the righteousness of Jesus, that he paid for our sins, that, that we get credit for his righteousness when we put our de depend on him. So we're just asking you to stop trying to get to heaven through your own efforts and give up and say, I can't do it. I need to be saved and understand that there is a savior, but there's only one. He's Jesus Christ. And if you depend on him completely and understand that, you don't have any role in it. You're just going to have to trust him instead. That's when he gives you this eternal life in the kingdom of God as a gift. No strings attached. All right, brothers. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Brother Jeff and Brother Bill just to say goodbye to everybody and anything else you want to add, and then we'll close the show. Brother Jeff? Yeah, right. Thanks for... Uh having a great time but it's um I'll, I'll add to what you and just bill just said that uh there's a facebook group called christian uh, theology and discussion i was saying to someone that uh, unless you unless you give up depending on yourself and trusting yourself you are likely to face the great 
white throne judgment. This was a poor washer fan, yeah. And I say you're going to go along with him, and you're going to stand. And you've had more chances than most people to accept the gospel. And somebody else agreed with me, but this person said, "Yes, that's right. You have to believe the right things." Now, I thought, "Oh no, no, wait a minute, no. It's believe on the Lord Jesus Christ." I don't think. This is one of the things I didn't like in dispensationalism. So if you believe that doctrine, the Paul's gospel, as they called it, then you'll be saved. But, but it is on the person of Jesus Christ. Because I've tried religion and I've tried, I mean, I mean uh, you know, five steps to a successful life and all the rest of it. And I've done Buddhism. And, and it don't work. It, it don't work. You're just kidding yourself and everybody else. You, you just put on this fluffy teddy bear suit and try to be nice but slightest bit of stress and you're down there again it doesn't work but uh, I, I've, I've come to the place where all, all I can say is it's not about me it, it, it's all about him it, it's his righteousness it's his faith it's his works and it's just not about me it's not and it, it's, it's a great life it, it, it really is to every day waking up in the morning and I, I just just sometimes I wake up and I just got a laugh I really have to think that I could save myself or I could do something to please God because the, the, this this body is just going down and anything I do in this body is temporary but he is eternal he's the eternal God and it, I can just trust trust in him and be satisfied that he created me like this, yeah. And, and if God's satisfied with me, I, I don't care who criticizes me. That, you know, that anyone can criticize me, but um, He's accepted me the way I am. And every sin that Jesus went to the cross for at the time, I wasn't around two thousand years ago, so every sin was a future sin. So whatever I do tomorrow, which I find, you know, I'm saying like, uh, oh yeah. Well, that wasn't very godly of me, was it? And uh, I shall have to repent of this. And that's, that's all nonsense. It, it's, it's just every, every day is a right. I and mean, it's, it's a brilliant life. Yeah. Thank you, brother. That was uh, that was a brilliant statement. Um, I use the word brilliant in honor of your, you English people. Yeah, I know you like to use that word, and I think it was good. Uh, brother Bill, final words? Yeah, I'll you just get to endorse... What, what, what Brother Jeff was saying there, it's absolutely nothing to do with us whatsoever. It's all to do with Christ. You know, the Bible says, you know what, righteousness, all the good things we do, they're filthy rags, they're not acceptable. There's only one thing acceptable in our lives, and that is Christ in us, the hope of glory. That is what is acceptable, not our flesh and blood. All right, I say amen and amen uh, to all of the viewers. Um, if you understand that salvation is a free gift, God's offering you right now through faith alone in Christ alone, put your faith in Jesus, receive the gift of eternal life, and then make a comment on the video and say, today you are born again as a child of God. And we'd love to hear that. So we'll see you next time. Uh, bless you all in the name of our great Savior God. His name is Jesus Christ.